I'll let you get started. All right, great. All right, now that the recording started, if I can have all committee members turn on your cameras. We're gonna call this meeting to order. This is the notice of a uh, noticed public meeting of the Child Support Guidelines Committee. It's May 20th, 2022. It is 9 a.m. And I am gonna start the meeting with a uh, roll call. Um, in proceeding to do that, I wanna put the committee on notice that uh, we, Jack Fleeman has uh, asked for personal reasons to be removed from the committee. And so I have reached out. He is a representative of the family law section of the State Bar of Nevada. I have reached out to the family law section and asked them to begin the process of replacing him so that seat will be vacant until they appoint somebody. Uh, let's start with roll call and let's start with uh, Ms. Baker. Present. Ms. Cliff? Present. Assemblywoman Cohen? Here. Uh, Alan Cresilius? Here. Assemblywoman Hardy? Senator Harris? Judge Hoskin? I'm here. Kathy Kaplan? I'm here. Senator Pickard? I am here. Judge Robb? All right, uh, Mr. Sanford. Present. Judge Shirley. Myself and Justice Stiglitch. Present. All right, we have a quorum. All right, I'm gonna proceed on to public comment. At this time, we will take public comment. Public comment is limited to three minutes per person. Uh, we do strictly adhere to that rule. So please uh, let us know if uh, you do need additional time and you didn't get it all done in three minutes. And perhaps depending on the topic, I may be able to put, place you on a future agenda. All right. To give public comment, please raise your hand in the Zoom meeting or press star nine on your phone to take your place in the queue. It looks like we have someone who called in who is ready to give public comment. So, okay, as we proceed with that, if you could please um, send Judge Rob the link again. She's having troubles getting into the call. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, the individual who has called in, can you please announce your name? And you have three minutes to give public comment. Hi, everyone. This is Jimmy Carr from Reno. Um, with comments on agenda items seven and eight. I'll start with item eight, the proposed language for joint custody, um, because my comment's pretty short on that. I just want to express my support of using one half of the difference uh, in support obligations, because I think that's fair for everyone, including the child, and that it tends to equalize the child-related money in both households. Regarding item number seven, the serial parenting, and exhibit seven or exhibit three. Um, I suggest clarifying in any final language what it means when there are two or more child support orders effective at the same time. Specifically in my situation, I have joint custody to one of my kids and primary the other, um, two separate orders. Um, for the joint custody situation, uh, the support is set at zero. And it's unclear if this would be considered a child support order under the serial parenting rules um, because it's zero dollars. I think it would be wise for the committee to clarify if a zero dollar child support order would qualify a parent for consideration of the concessions under the serial parenting scheme or if the zero dollar child support order would not actually be considered in that situation. Um, and that, that's all I have. And I appreciate you taking my call. We appreciate your time, sir. If you could, can you please uh, spell your last name for the record? C A R R. Okay, perfect. All right, Mr. Carr, we appreciate your time and please call in more. We need more public comment from people like you, and your time is appreciated. Is there anyone else that wants to give public comment? It looks like Miss Green has her hand raised. Okay. 
Go ahead, Ms. Green, and uh, you have three minutes. Um, I'm speaking against um, equalizing, uh, at attempting to equalize income um, with regard to uh, the calculations for joint physical custody. We find here at Legal Aid, and I've seen in general um, at court, um, you know, just, just in terms of the community legal education classes we do, we see hundreds, if not thousands of people uh, during the year. People are living at the poverty level, um, uh, litigating these cases through family court because of the preference for joint physical custody. A lot of times a parent has traditionally had um, de facto custody of children. They wind up with joint physical custody. And as soon as the court case is over, the person who got the uh, preferential uh, calculations on joint physical custody do not pick up the children. Children are living in poverty. They're falling further into to poverty. And uh, changing these calculations, they're already low enough. They were lowered to 16% to 22%. That hit was taken. Now there is an attempt for what appears to be no logical reasons whatsoever, because it's not based on the individual finances of the parties to reduce it further by taking the difference and then splitting that in half. It just means more children are going to go into poverty as well as the person who generally takes primary responsibility for children. And that's particularly dangerous in the times that we are living in right now where rent is escalating. We see here at Legal Aid, evictions are, are just at, at a stage where we can hardly process the calls and the people at the self-help center. People's rents are being doubled and raised hundreds and hundreds of dollars. And this is something that's never happened before. And taking care of children, and we all, I don't have to tell this group, it involves paying rent. This is how you take care of children. You have a roof over their heads, you're able to feed them, you're able to clothe them. So doing something like this at this time would just be cruel. And it's gonna set off a set of circumstances, the likes of which we have never seen. This is dangerous and it should not be done. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Green, good timing. We appreciate your time. Okay, you're welcome. All right, do we have anybody else that would like to give public comment? Looks like uh, Giovanni Andrade. Okay. Giovanni, uh, good morning. Uh, sure. If you could start with spelling your name for the record, sorry, you have a little more complicated name and then you have three minutes. Sure thing, Giovanni, G-I-O-V-A-N-N-I, Andrade, A-N-D-R-A, D-E. I'm the staff attorney here at the Family Law Self-Help Center in Clark County. And I wanna echo uh, April Green's comments regarding uh, cutting child support essentially in half on joint custody situations. Um, the new calculation would be cutting the initial child support obligation from on one child from 16% to 8% um, if you do the math the other way. I don't understand how um, this is gonna benefit the child at all. The difference between, um, you know, half the amount of child support would be the difference between someone who is a low income parent being able to afford a safe and uh, place for the child uh, to be raised. Uh, thank you for your time. All right, thank you, I appreciate it. All right, do we have anybody else? Ms. Tomlinson. I'm showing no other hands raised at this time. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. All right, we will move on to the next agenda item, which is approval of the meeting minutes from March 25th, 2022. Do I have anybody willing to make a motion? So moved. All right, Senator Pickard, do I have a second? Second. Second, Mr. Sanford. Any further discussion? Yes, Assemblywoman Cohen. I wasn't present, so I'll be abstaining. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to abstain because I got them so late. I didn't have a chance to uh, to see them. Okay. No problem. All right. I'm in the same boat. 
Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor, state aye. 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 Opposed? And I have our noted abstentions. Motion passes. Mr. Ratt. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. Um, so I sent you an email, but we were unable to get the meeting minutes um, posted for the public. Um, so we were advised by the DAG that we can't vote on them today. Okay. Um, and we'll need to vote on them at the next meeting. All right, that vote is now withdrawn. All right. We're following uh, proper Let's order, follow. Madam Chair. I was about I'll, to. I'll uh, uh, move to rescind our action. All right. You rescind your motion, Mr. Sanford. Do you rescind your second? Yes. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. All right. Motion passes. All right. Let's move on to the next agenda item. Before we do so, um, Let's discuss briefly um, the exhibits did not come in as organized as they have in the past with the exhibit numbers. Part of that is because I need the committee to submit their exhibits early enough that we can do that. We can get them organized. We can get them out to everybody so we can read them. Same thing with the, the uh, meeting minutes. So um, we're going to flounder through this a little bit, but I'm going to guide us on where we are um through the process we are going to go ahead and skip down to agenda item number six discussion and recommendations on proposed reorganization and language changes to the nac that one did get a proper exhibit number on it as exhibit two and mr sanford do you want to um give us any follow-up on that sure so i know at the last meeting we had discussed maybe uh having it, uh, more, more members involved. I don't think we ended up doing that, but I did go through and make a lot of the typographical changes that, that had been uh, kind of a mistakes in the last one. I think the only major changes that weren't um, specifically discussed, but were something that I had looked at when actually going through the drafting was uh, 425.110. Uh, there, it had a couple of I guess, redundant aspects as to the stipulation. Um, and so I kind of re reorganized the language a little bit there. Um, other than that, I think it's mostly been the, the same as it was. The only major changes uh, I think that we need to do and make a decision moving forward is where we actually want this to be. I know we had discussed at the last uh, meeting, um, I think my recommendation was making it like between 100 and 110 uh, for the for the dot xxx piece, but um, that was, I think, something that was going to be at least thought about as we as we move forward. Okay, and for clarification on the record, the the language that is in purple, um, Mr. Sanford used the master document, and so those are votes that we've already done. So what we're really discussing is the language in red line or blue lined, I guess is the better language, uh, by Mr. Sanford in this document. Do we have any further comments from the committee on this? Madam Chair, I just have a question if I may. I, uh, um, I wonder if, I, I, I like what's being done. I completely agree with it. Um, I think we probably just procedurally should table it uh, uh, until we get all the other decisions made and then let this be kind of the culminating effort. Um, I, I certainly agree with everything he's done. We just have too many X's to uh, really feel like, for me to feel comfortable voting on this. So uh, I, I think he's going in, they are going in exactly the right direction. Uh, I just think we probably... Um, because it's an agenda item already, rather than settling on this and then creating a new one to make additional adjustments as we make other changes. Uh, we, we probably should wait to take any final action on this until we also incorporate the other things. Okay, additional committee comments? What about input on, I mean, I, I, I agree with that, Senator Pickard, um, 
I don't know that we necessarily can't figure out where the XXX should fall. Um, and I know our discussion was before, I don't know, it was right before 110, right, that we discussed. Okay. Um, and I don't have a problem with that. I think that it falls nicely there. And that was the prior discussion. Um, but if anybody has any other input, we can keep this quote unquote on the back burner while we figure out the rest of our substantive changes. Not that these aren't substantive, but they are not, not the same as changing the, site, the actual calculations, right? Right, and, and if I may, I don't wanna skip ahead to seven yet, but the reason I said that was because uh, my initial suggestion uh, for where to put uh, the uh, new language for uh, agenda item number seven uh, was overruled by my subcommittee mates. Uh, they said it, it really belongs better in another location. And so all, all, all I'm thinking okay. is that because uh, I just went through that experience, we might want to, I, I agree, and we probably should plug it in there, but leave it as XXX until we know where the other new language, assuming we have new language, is plugged in, and then we can work with LCB to come up with an appropriate numbering system. Okay. Any further comments before we move on to the next agenda item? Okay, Mr. Sanford, thank you for the effort on this. It, it, it moves us forward <laughs> and is a lot of assistance. I appreciate it. Uh, we're gonna move on to agenda item number seven, and uh, that is discussion and recommendations on a formula to address new possible codes to calculate uh, child support for serial parenting scenarios. Uh, a, a document was submitted, but then not given to the committee, correct? Um, I, I, I'll let the subcommittee members explain what's going on with this one at this point. I don't know who's taking the lead, if it's Senator Pickard. Okay. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll do it because it's my mea culpa, I think. Um, uh, I originally, just for uh, discussion purposes, plugged it in as an adjustment. Uh, and I'll let uh, uh, Joe and Karen uh, speak to uh, their feelings about why we ultimately decided that we should probably recommend a different location. But basically, it came down to uh, this really isn't an adjustment. This is one of those first considerations made as we cascade through the decisions and then we get to the calculation. So it should occur probably before 140 and maybe uh, uh, right after the initial language uh, where we were starting to, uh, uh, well, we first define the, uh, what is gross income and we go through those machinations and then we start saying, okay, here's how we consider this. And so if you have multiple uh, orders. And I think the uh, uh, comment, uh, you know, we need to clarify zero dollar orders is a great point. We do. Um, we need to make sure that the courts are uh, understand that uh, it, an order, even if the order is zero, it's a predefined order. And so we should probably address that in the language as well. But it, it's one of those early considerations uh, because we need some guidance and how we're going to calculate this. That's one of the very first things we have to know is how many kids are actually being dealt with here, even if they're not part of this immediate order. And so they've convinced me that the better place is up ahead. And so uh, we've got uh, a, a, a suggestion floating amongst ourselves, but I would suggest with that, uh, I, I, I'd really like to take comments about the language and, and how we're addressing it. Uh, but uh, understand that I think we're going to recommend that that occurs earlier. And then just to follow up for Senator Pickard, uh, Joe Sanford for the record, we had uh, some additional discussion specifically about, and I think part of the reason the language isn't totally before this committee is that we hadn't decided how we wanted to handle joint physical custody orders as they relate to this as to whether those joint physical custody orders count as a child support order at all um, or zero orders and uh, specifically, but uh, some of the ideas were, were coming up as, you know, if we had, you know, say two or three other zero orders and get a new case, you might have a significant offset 
that may not be warranted. And so we were still sort of fleshing out some of those details. Um, so I think there's still some work here. I was going to make a comment uh, because it's been brought up to me by at least two separate people now. Um, there, there was some offense to the term serial uh, in the serial parenting um, language. I'm not, I'm not personally very clear on what Often the offense basis was. Oh, okay. Some, like uh, some personal offense that the, just the term itself was derogatory. Oh. I, I didn't totally understand, but it was a comment that was made to me. It came up at the hearing master conference um, for child support hearing masters. Um, and so I just wanted to make the committee aware of that concern um, for, for what it's worth. I, I don't totally understand the objection, but I do I did think that if somebody else understood it, maybe they could explain it. And uh, if we had a better word or a, something that, uh, more captured, I think, our intent, then we'll be up for that as well. Okay. Ms. Cliff, do you have anything to add? Uh, I, this is Karen Cliff for the record. Um, I will just mirror um, both Keith and um, Joseph's uh, thoughts. Um, we were still trying to figure out, and I think we came up with some verbiage to address it at the tail end, but those scenarios where you know, we have a, a JPC case um, and we're trying to establish the support obligation for just for ease of reference, let's say mother and father. And um, let's say father would have been the, the payor in a JPC situation. But when we consider father's additional children, suddenly maybe father is no longer the payor the obligation becomes minimal, or perhaps even now mother becomes the obligor because maybe mother does not have other children. So how do we reconcile those scenarios? So in the last subcommittee meeting, we were kind of trying to figure out all these various scenarios and how do we compensate for it? And there was some verbiage added in about, you know, the obligation not being more than Keith had added some other verbiage. Anyways, we're still trying to wrap our heads around sort of all the scenarios that we could come up with. But uh, prior to the next date, I can work within our subcommittee to I see Judge Hoskins hands up to come up with some <laughs> words um, in uh, perhaps as an option to serial. I can start looking at some other jurisdictions and see if there's some other terms that may be are less offensive. Would that be good, Keith, Joe? Yeah, I, I think that'd be appropriate. Uh, I uh, uh, ultimately, um, uh, and I wasn't, uh, because we didn't produce the document, I wasn't kind of gonna get into the details, but you raise a great point. Uh, and I, I think it's good for the committee to hear that we're aware of that. And uh, uh, so we had tossed around the idea of, um, uh, making, doing, you know, using similar language as we have uh, elsewhere about limiting the uh, uh, obligation to, uh, you know, it, it, it would go no, it wouldn't go no further than zero. Um, uh, so that the uh, 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 um, uh, disadvantaged spouse, if you will, uh, is uh, uh, not paying to the other. Uh, but we, we, as I said, we, we have some work to do and so uh, we or we provided this uh, as an exhibit simply to generate comments uh, uh, from the committee so that it would give us further guidance as we're looking at the final language. Okay, Judge Hoskin. Nope. <laughs> You're turning off your video instead of unmuting yourself. <laughs> Sorry, new, uh, new technology for me here. Um, let me let me start my comments here by indicating that I previous meetings I've indicated that I've tried to come up with a plan for this I've been unsuccessful so I appreciate the efforts and please don't take what I'm saying is as personal against the guys that put this together so I, I appreciate the efforts, but from my standpoint, this is way, way too limiting from a judicial side in what I'm able to have discretion on and not. There's too many shalls, 
There's too many definitives and it's gonna come up with a situation like the, the person who commented indicated that we're gonna end up where I don't have any discretion and I've got to do something that I think is not in the children's best interest, which then takes us up to the Supreme Court and they tell me, no, you can't do that because we made that very clear. So, uh, and I understand it's a work in progress. You guys don't, don't take it any more than that. But while you're working on that, please keep that in the back of your mind that as a judicial officer, I kind of need the ability at the very end to say, look, this is not right sized. It's not in the best interest and I need to do this and have the ability to do that. And moving it out of adjustments, I, I think it solves one problem, but creates another one. If it's just an adjustment, then it's discretionary to begin with. But if it's out of adjustments, then we need to be more careful with the language so that everybody's clear as to what we're supposed to be doing. So that's, that's my comment with regard to that. And thank you for taking a stab at it and continuing to be willing to work on it. And with that, uh, Judge, I, I hope that comes with a, uh, uh, a volunteering of uh, working with us because yours is a perspective we completely lack. We are on the other side of, of the, the well. And so uh, if it's all right, we'd like to, I would like to invite you to participate in the discussion so we have your insight. And, and with all that comes with that, Senator, I'm happy to oblige. Very good. <laughs> um, you guys, this is, this is Sharon Benson, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I'm hearing a lot of, dis, of, a lot of um, group discussions going on. Um, you guys should probably make this an official subcommittee with um, open meeting law and follow the open meeting. You have two, you, you're, you're meeting with three, four, I don't know how many people. It, it really needs to be done officially. It's not and I can talk to Ms. Surratt afterwards or, or Ms. Sure. Ms. Tomlinson yeah. and help Ms. you set that up. I'll go over it. They're not hitting a violation. They haven't hit the numbers yet. So yeah. as long as they do not include any other committee members, we'll discuss it. But we're going to do strict adherence to that rule, but without claiming they've done anything wrong yet. They have not. Yeah, I, uh, I, I just, if I may, Madam Chair, my yeah. understanding is, and, and I just want to ask the question, that if we don't have a quorum, that if we don't have enough to be able to take action, that we're okay, but is that mistaken? That's true, as long as you don't create accidentally a walking quorum, which is reach right. out to another committee member and re who reaches out to another one. So right. you've got to keep it closed door between you. Right, okay. I just wanted to make sure I and everyone else understood that rule. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, any further discussion on this item um, other than just let them keep working hard on a very difficult <laughs> conversation? Madam Chair, if I might, I, I, it's interesting the comment we got about the, uh, uh, the serial parenting uh, oh. because uh, you know we, it, it, as we deal with this on a daily basis, we tend to look for shortcuts and maybe we don't consider how the outside world is going to view our, our language. So I think that uh, it's probably appropriate to review that in terms of you know, what we publish, even though we may internally call it serial parenting, because as practitioners, we, uh, we're already wordy. We try to, to uh, reduce the number of words, but uh, that's probably a good point. And, and so I would support the idea of of maybe changing that to something else. So maybe we should get some, uh, and we can probably do this offline where people can just publish to the group uh, suggestions. Uh, uh, but uh, anyway, if we need to actually make that part of the formal conversation, we certainly can. Okay, Judge Rob. Yeah, very quickly, I took a look at exactly that because um, I looked up the word serial to see why it would be offensive. Um, and I, I think I may have identified one of the issues. I mean, of course, serial murder, ser but the idea of serial marriage, which uh, is somewhat pejorative in that it's talking about very short term relationships. That's not at all what we're trying to say. I, what about successive? Because the other thing is we need a word that is easily understandable to a lay person. So I don't particularly like sequential because I think it becomes a little more scientific, but successive tells you that it's just one that follows the other. That would be my suggestion. 
Yeah, I started thinking of the other uses of the word cereal too. And I went, oh, <laughs> hadn't occurred to me before. I was just happy we had an easy way to reference it. Um, but anytime any member of the public, especially when there's a group of them saying that, that it's offensive, we've got to do something about it and quit util utilizing the term. So, um, all right, any other comments? All right, again, thank you. Um, we've been afraid to, <laughs> to work on this topic since we started this project. So um, at least somebody's digging into it now. All right, we are gonna move on to agenda item number eight, discussion and recommendations on the proposed language for NAC 425.115 subsection three for joint physical uh, custody to change the language to one half of the difference versus the full difference in child support values. We've held this topic on the agenda, uh, waiting for input from DWSS and they have submitted it now. Um, Ms. Kaplan, are you the one that's going to present that to us? Um, yes. Did you want me to read through it or just, you know, wondering if anybody had any questions on what was submitted? Um, well, it just got submitted. So has everybody had an opportunity to, to absorb it? Anybody concerned it should just be held over? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, having just received it, uh, and it's pretty detailed, I would really like to think through the examples. Um, uh, as I do this, you know, I, I think of the different bills, uh, we get examples, and typically they are the ones that come to mind to the person that's taking the position they do. Uh, and then there are probably examples to support the other side. Um, and, and so it gives us a balance. Um, you know, it's interesting, since I first proposed this, uh, I've had, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Keith Pickard for the record. Um, <laughs> I, uh, um, uh, I, I've taken a lot of, of uh, comments uh, over the past few months and uh, they're about even in number, but that's probably just happenstance. Uh, but both sides are making really good arguments. Um, uh, you know, and, and I was approaching this simply from a fairness issue because if we're actually going to be doing it, uh, uh, you know, one of the suggestions, in fact, was rather than half the difference, uh, why not a proportional difference? And that kind of made sense to me to address, you know, uh, uh, a fairness issue. Uh, if we're already doing it on a proportionate basis, maybe the division should be proportionate. But to just move the entire, in my mind, to move the entire difference to the obligor, uh, or the one who makes more money means he's paying greater than the statutory amount that was set forth in the, uh, uh, it, or, or as we tried to set forth in the guidelines. So, you know, and, and I, I kind of reject the idea that, uh, uh, you know, fairness is cruel, uh, but by the same token, you know, that those are the practical realities. We get people that are pushing the poverty level or past or underneath the poverty level, level who can't afford that extra $20. Uh, but the question again comes up, does it, is it fair for the person who happens to make more? And we're not usually talking about people that are making, you know, six, seven, eight figures either. Uh, they're, they're usually, those that are uh, on the poverty level usually uh, have a co-parent who's at or near the same amount, but yeah. not quite. And so uh, I, I think fairness really needs to control this. And I would really like to take this suggestion because it looks like it's uh, well thought through uh, and see what we can do uh, to come up with a counter argument if there is one and put it in the balance. And if there isn't one, then I think that their, uh, their uh, suggestion may control. I just don't have an opportunity really to, to judge that. Additional committee comment? This is Kathy Kaplan for the record, and I appreciate your comments on that, um, Keith Pickard. Um, if you read through the um, North Dakota um, provision that I put in there. It's actually a very interesting topic. I was um, happy to put that in my um, concerns. So I encourage everybody to read through that. It's not a, a long read, but it, they went through the same types of considerations that um, you guys are considering. And so I just 
and thankful that you guys are willing to read through it. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And that's exactly what I didn't have time to look at was those additional oh, readings that I'd really like to do that. So I appreciate that. I agree. And I will say that in the big picture of testimony we received on this through this commission, public comment has majority been parents who can't afford to pay the child support that was that they are required to pay. And a large number of them were joint physical custodians. And so it's still in my heart that there's an issue there because they're the ones coming forward um, and they are showing up and they are complaining and their ability to pay and what it does to them on a poverty level is ignored in the analysis that just the recipient is drowning from losing that extra money versus the payor is drowning from paying that extra money. So I, I still am concerned that there's a balance issue, but I, I too did not get a chance to click on the links. I paid really good attention to the exhibit, but I was like, oh goodness, I don't have time um, in trying to get all this ready. So I very much appreciate it. I very much appreciate the work being put into it because it, it gives us substance to dig into and have something to actually grapple with. So um, unless there is additional committee comments right now, I will hold this over for the next agenda item or next agenda for the next meeting. Sorry, I'm losing it. I'm tired today, obviously. End of the week. Any just additional? a quick comment. Just this yeah. is Karen Cliff. Um, I got a chance to read it and I have to say it was really compelling and it was really nice to see. Um, it was really nice to see that another jurisdiction had contemplated this change. And it was really nice to see the state director actually propose this change. And after such wonderful, amazing, constructive comments and testimony for that director to say, you know what, reevaluating it, this is not something that as a state we're going to do. And there were some really interesting thoughts in there about custody. You know, custody isn't always 50 50, sometimes it's 60 40. So when you take that parent with 60% custody and cut that support they receive in half, it's really interesting to see how that works. So I appreciate the public, the public comment today, not just from legal aid, um, who I applaud everything they do, but also from our self-help center. I appreciate, appreciate Mr. Andre's um, testimony as well. And I also wanna thank Kathy um, for finding this, this information and of course, all of your work. So I look forward to the next go around on this. Great. Additional comments? I do just have one comment on the exhibit, just so that I was clear on what the example had. Um, I'll take recent case example one. I have a, it's it's got a gross monthly income of 6,588 for the first parent, 1,690 for the second parent. So the obligations would be 1,007 versus 270. And then it says ordered obligation was 481 reduction take for support of another child. Is that, was that a case where there was another child of the obligor that there was a, an adjustment based for? Is that what I was supposed to understand there? Yes. Okay. I, I just wanted to make sure because it, you know, had how much was ultimately being paid. And I just wanted to understand if it was based off of, you know, pure numbers or, or in this case, there was a deviation already. Okay, right. thank you. And Madam Chair, on that point, uh, I wasn't gonna get into the details, but uh, that was my assumption that the court had made a, an additional adjustment. So uh, that was my concern with that one example was that we've plugged in a, uh, an adjustment that was made uh, uh, that kind of uh, hides the fact uh, of the, uh, uh, the half the difference argument or, or calculation, uh, because the courts are always, uh, we or our intent is to give the courts discretion to right size, as we keep saying, the uh, ultimate award. So it looks like in example number one, that's exactly what happened. The court tried to right size it uh, by taking consideration of additional children. Uh, and so it's, it, I, 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 I want to come up with examples that, you know, show how 
a uh, half the difference, or even uh, as was proposed uh, to me personally last week, a proportional difference, um, how that would be unfair uh, in any given situation, given uh, the mandate of NRS 125C001, that all parents have an equivalent duty to support their children. They are to support to the, the same extent or the same effort, uh, not on a dollar basis, we've acknowledged that, but certainly they have every obligation that the other parent has to support their children to the maximum extent they can. That's where I think the fairness balance uh, needs to be struck. And uh, um, uh, I, I wanna make sure that the examples uh, that we can use come up with a uh, spotlight that focuses on that issue without it uh, being uh, um, uh, affected. I, I wanna say contaminated, but that's the wrong word, but, but uh, skewed by uh, an additional uh, variable that uh, shouldn't be used. I would, sorry, go ahead. I was just yeah. going to comment that these are um, recent cases that came through our program. And I do have other examples. I just didn't have enough time to get through all of the examples to put on the yeah. concerns. So if you guys need more information, I will provide it at the next meeting. Yeah, I would just, I would highlight what I think gets forgotten in the conversation is the obligor has the children at least 50% of the time, or it might be a 60, 40, I get it, but they might be the one with 60% of the time with the kids and a big chunk of payment that they're paying. So we're, you know, it's real easy on paper to be like, oh my gosh, they're paying less money, but they, they're not falling down on the job with raising their kids either. Um, they, they have a, a very decent obligation towards them. So um, that when things get really heated or strong in the language about it being unfair and, and terrible and, and woes, you know, it, it, it just, to me, it's forgetting that these people are, their emotions are wrapped up in the fact that they are at the table and they are parenting and they are doing it to a great extent. Uh, Judge Rob. Bridget Rob for the record. Um, and Quite frankly, that was um, one of my concerns in looking at some of these examples. Uh, there's the old maxim, bad, fake, bad facts make bad law. And we can find circumstances where any statute in a particular circumstance works a hardship. That's what judges are supposed to be for, is to be able to be the human element that balances some of these things and keeps that hardship from occurring. And so that's why Judge Hoskin has said it many times, and I agree wholeheartedly, that the judges need some discretion to be able to, as we keep saying, right-size this, not just for the obligee, but also for the obligor. Because we do have, I remember the testimony that we received the, the last time we were meeting from obligors who were very involved with their children and were saying, we, we can't even go out and do anything entertaining with our kids because I'm paying all this money in child support. Uh, we, we have to strike a balance. And sometimes that balance in, in a single case, that balance is not going to work. That's why we have discretion built in. And Madam Chair, if I could just uh, tack onto that, Keith Picker for the record. Um, I, I completely agree uh, with what Judge Rob just said. And I think that uh, one of the dangers we have in the discussion is talking about this as reducing the obligation. And we may be reducing a number, but my goal is to reduce it to what's actually fair. I don't think it's appropriate if, if, in my mind, it's unfair for somebody to take more than their proportionate share of the duty. That's why we wrote in uh, the duty in uh, 125C001. And so to me, when I hear people, you know, it's, it's the old, uh, well, not old, it's, it's coming back, this, you know, pay their fair share, right? We hear that in all sorts of different contexts. Well, what's, what's their fair share? 
their fair share should be a proportion. If, if we have agreed and we have, it's well settled that we take a proportionate share of the obligation based on income um, and, and we divvy that up. The only question is who pays the difference? And we deviate, we depart from what's fair when we shove more than a proportionate share to the obligor. And so I, I resist this notion of saying, well, we're reducing what the, the recipient should be receiving. And that's not accurate. We're reducing it because it's unfair. And so I just wanted to tack on what Judge Rob just said to say, I, I, I think we need to dispense with this argument that it's unfair because it's already unfair. And it's never gonna be perfectly fair until the judge has an opportunity to look at all of the factors and make the adjustments to make it right sized. And so I completely agree with what Judge Rob and what Judge Hoskin have said. They need that discretion. We need those adjustment factors, but we need to start with what from a basic level appears to be fair, appears to be proportionate, and then make the adjustments from there. Additional comments? Okay, we're gonna, I'm gonna hold it over to the next agenda and allow us all to take more time to look into it. Um, I beg of the committee to put some individual research time into it and um, some thought into it. It's real easy to rely on the other committee members to just show up with the stuff and then think about it only in the meeting. But this is one of those items I think we all need to uh, just know I want sleeves rolled up and us to really work on it next agenda. All right, agenda item number number nine, discussion and recommendations on the proposed language for NAC 425.115, subsection four, for scenarios in which a parent has primary physical custody of one child each, and when the other parent has primary over one child, but both parents have joint physical custody over two other children. Basically, this was the missing language in that section, and Ms. Baker, you're up. Thank you. Um, we actually already addressed uh, the issue of when one parent has primary over one child, but both parents have joint physical over the other. That language was actually already in for. So the only change that I made was to address the issue when each parent might have uh, primary physical custody of one or more of the children. Um, and that's in the red. Um, basically, it sort of mirrored the, the language for the uh, joint physical and shared um, or primary with one. Okay, and did everybody get a chance to see that proposed language? Any additional committee comments on it? My comment would be it fills the hole and I think and I'll have a problem with the language. <laughs> it adds that extra language that, you know, who knew we were missing, but uh, does anybody want to make a motion on this? Kathleen Baker, for the record, um, I would move that um, we amend section four of NAC 425.115 uh, to reflect that if the parties have two or more children and A, each party has joint physical custody of at least one, but not all of the children, or B, each party has primary physical custody of one or more, but not all of the children, the total child support obligation of each party must be determined based on the number of children to whom each party owes a child support obligation and that after each party's respective child support obligation is determined, the child support obligations must be offset. So the party with the higher child support obligation pays the other party the difference. Do I have a second? Second. I missed Question. that was, was that Mr. Sanford? Or who, who seconded? That, that was me. Okay, uh, <laughs> thank you. And discussion. If I may. Yes. Chief Picker, for the record. Uh, Ms. Baker, I like it. The only question I have is, as we're addressing, uh, uh, as we were just discussing this idea of a, uh, uh, an adjustment to the paying of the difference, um, uh, I'm assuming that if we adopt uh, in the future that uh, um, that would mir be mirrored here. Is that your expectation? I think that would be up to discussion by the committee. Um, I don't. I don't know that I have an expectation at this point in time. 
Okay, I uh, I can certainly support it, uh, Madam Chair. I just uh, would uh, uh, ask that we set the expectation that if the committee uh, goes to uh, um, a decision to do some kind of proportionate division of the difference, that that would carry over. Well, I would say that we haven't proposed all the language changes that would be needed for that. And if we do, we'll come up with all the language that's needed through the entire chapter. But Better stated, thank you. <laughs> when the time comes. All right, any further discussion? All right, all in favor, state aye. 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 Anyone aye. opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. I will incorporate it into master document. Okay, moving on to agenda item number 10, discussion and recommendations, clarification of NAC 425.025-1M uh, and the inclusion of alimony and gross income in the regulations versus NAC 425.0252 that does not include or deduct alimony paid from the obligor's income. And Judge Rob and I made some efforts on this. And Judge Rob, do you want to propose your exhibit? And obviously there's no pride of authorship here. I tried to stay away from the word deduction because we use it in other sections of um, this NAC. And so deletion, subtraction, however you want to deal with this. Um, but we had talked and we wanted at least to have some language to look at the idea that in this case, so involving these two people with children, when you have an obligor who also is paying alimony, uh, we had talked about the idea that if, it, if that alimony is actually being paid, it is, I'm going to stay away from unfair, but it appears to be inequitable to have that same party have their child support obligation determined based on an amount of money that they don't have, particularly from where I sit when they are also paying um, taxes on that money that for the alimony that they are paying, the other party gets that alimony free and clear of taxes. And there, there's no consideration of that in the alimony uh, calculation that we're making right now. Uh, we have changed the gross income to include alimony receipt, which I think is appropriate. This is, as I see it, simply the other side of that coin. Um, and once again, it, to me, just as Senator Pickard noted a, a while ago, this is simply a ma matter of starting from the right place. And if those dollars don't exist in someone's income and we know where those dollars went and they're, they're going to the other party who is also part of this calculation, it seems to me to be uh, inappropriate to start with phantom money that isn't there. And so this was my attempt to kind of capture how we would start at what I deem, what I believe to be the right place. I would add, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, take the wind out of Judge Hoskins because I know it's coming. The um, Discretion of the court, right? So we can leave it up to the discretion of the court. We can leave it up to the adjustments and hope the right thing comes down um, and that the judge does the right thing. But not all judges are Judge Hoskin and not all judges do what they're supposed to do <laughs> and do what's right for that ability to pay and adjust. Uh, I know, big wide mouth. <laughs> so um, we all, through the conversations through this committee, we did narrow down the two scenarios, which is, it's a whole different thing if that alimony is going outside of the people we're talking about right here in front of us. But when the control is over those two parties and alimony has been, is being paid between those two parties, that's what we were trying to do. Now, deletion um, was a word Judge Rob came up with. And at first I thought, 
Oh, that's interesting because I don't know if we've used that word anywhere in the law. I also don't know if maybe it's a a problem because it's not a defined term, right? Um, because we don't use it anywhere else in the law. So we may be getting too creative with that. We're probably going to get a bunch of people hit us and go, I don't know what the word deletion means. That means nothing in law. Um, but we had to have some kind of starting point for discussion. And um, as Judge Rob stated, no pride in authorship. It was, this was to get us, get the ball rolling, maybe on some discussion of something. Uh, any committee comments? Judge Hoskin. <laughs> it's going to be a much shorter comment, thanks to you, Mr. Oh, okay. Rad. I appreciate that. <laughs> the, the, uh, and let me indicate that I, I'm not opposed to doing this. Certainly, I think that the language at the top without limitation gives me the ability to do this, but I understand that others have a different approach to it, so I'm fine with this. My only suggestion would be that we use reduce, perhaps, instead of delete. Um, which I think is would be clearer and give a little more. Um, well, I don't know what the what that word is. Sorry, I came up with one word. I get one word today. Reduce. Perfect <laughs> word. Thank you, Judge Hoskin. Uh, Judge Rob, for the record. Uh, Mr. Sanford. I was actually going to oh. say make the same comment. Uh, I think if we just said may reduce, I think you have to actually shift the words around. But I'd say may reduce. The obligor's gross monthly income by the amount of alimony actually paid. I think uh, is a little clearer than than delete. Um, Jay Hoskin already did it. So, <laughs> okay. Additional committee comments. Assemblywoman Cohen. Thank you. I. I like the language and I don't know if this was already addressed um, at another time, but are, are, um, do we need to discuss the mechanics of what happens when the alimony goes away? Because in most, in most cases, a lot of cases, alimony lasts longer than child support quite often. And so are we setting people up for yeah, I, I guess I just want to make sure that we've we've thought about do we need to address it or is that covered enough in the rest of, of 425 so that if parties have to go back to court, they just go back to court. Um, that would be my only concern. What that reminds me of is just how many times we've gotten into a hole with this committee because we don't because of our lack of jurisdiction over modification language that we all know through the work of this committee that some changes are really needed. Um, that's what the, my first instinct is, of course, to go, oh, I don't know. Let's look if we even have a authority over that or if we step in on other statutes that aren't within our purview, but additional committee comments? It's um, the verbiage actually pay, who's going to monitor that? I mean, are we gonna find ourselves consistently dealing with modifications because he, he or she didn't pay alimony that month and they want the child support readdressed? I'm just wondering what, what we're sort of opening up here. Ordered versus actually paid. I'm not a huge fan of the word actually. Um, I think this came up in the AML language too. <laughs> We're kind of stomped on that word, I think, before too. But um, yeah, I would say ordered, but I don't know. Judge Rob? The, the only thing is, um, and I'm um, going back to comments that were made when this issue was raised several meetings ago, there was concern that if it's just ordered and the party who's supposed to be paying the alimony isn't paying that alimony, then they're getting a break for something that they're not doing, which is why um, I included uh, that the alimony had to be paid. Um, uh, if you can find a better word, Ms. Surratt, I am, I am happy to include that, um, but that's why I include the word actually. It, it has to be um, money that has been received by the obligee. Um, in order for it to be considered for a reduction when the, um, you know, when child support is being established or modified. But then you're gonna get attorneys are gonna jump right into that loophole and say, well, it's not ordered yet. Like if we're working on a divorce and the 
order is going to incorporate both child support and alimony. It's not paid yet. So, and I know where lawyers go with this. We all do. <laughs> and there's your, you know, the next issue. Yeah. Senator Pickard. I, I, and I, I agree with Judge Rob's impulse there. Uh, my concern, though, and it just occurred to me, uh, is that a judgment follows. If you don't pay alimony, it mm -hmm. becomes a judgment. It's still enforceable. It's still due to the individual. Uh, it, it shifts over to the receivable column in the books, but it's still money that's due and, and enforceable. And so I, 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 I think if we were to say ordered, it's probably appropriate because they don't lose the right to collect that. Um, it, it would, if we then, and I'd like uh, Ms. Cliff's point, because if we're now opening up the, uh, if we say actually paid, now we're going to be getting, oh, you know, every month that it's missed and maybe they missed three months out of the year, but those are three more uh, uh, petitions for review because they didn't pay it. Um, I, I think we might be uh, opening up a door to, unnecessary litigation, but say we did and say we adjusted that month and the, we, we said, well, you didn't pay it this month, so we're going to adjust that. Um, and then the, the obligee comes back and tries to enforce it. Well, now is that unjust enrichment? What other uh, uh, counterclaims or, or uh, uh, defenses are we raising by using the term uh, actually, although I completely understand Judge Rob's impulse there. Um, I, I agree, but because that judgment exists, I wonder, are we then opening up another can of worms? Bridget Rob, for the record, I have no problem with taking that out. I, I was trying to capture what I thought had been discussions that we'd had before. Uh, I am less uh, offended, I guess, by the fact that, um, someone could not get the benefit of paying alimony if it's not timely paid and the obligee then is forced to chase it there there is time money sometimes attorney's fees involved in chasing that which the obligee is not going to be compensated for so to use a vernacular vernacular i used to use with my clients Sometimes if you don't do what you're supposed to do, you pay the stupid tax for not having done it. Um, so that part of it doesn't offend me, but if it makes it easier for Ms. Cliff and um, Ms. Baker to be able to, uh, to enforce this, I'm happy to remove that. If they're not paying alimony, they're probably not paying the child support either, <laughs> let's be honest, but... <laughs> intellectual honesty right judge hoskin <laughs> although um if they're going to pick one or the other it's almost always the child support that gets paid yeah miss cliff well this is <laughs> um, my support for this proposal is probably the same whether it reads actually paid or um ordered i have i have I have real sort of um, just internal concerns about deducting anything um, when it comes to the support of children. I, 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 I think that when a judge orders alimony, um, they've assessed the case and they've assessed the needs of that family, whether it's the whoever it is that's deserving of the alimony and they've assessed the, the needs of the child. And um, it's, it's hard to think about deducting one to pay for the other. And I, and I do understand the expenses and the, the ghost money and all of the, the other things, but so goes criminal restitution and a lot of other things. And when we open up this door, I fear that every other uh, um, expense could be later considered. And, um, you know, when, when alimony is granted for, for a, let's say a woman, for example, it's to make her whole, right? She might've gone years and years without getting those skills and the job and all of those other things. And so it, it, it pains me to even see this being discussed. It's hard, but I hear you, um, but I will not be voting in support of this. And I know we're not at that place, but it doesn't, the, the verbiage to me, this, the specifics, while it's hard for us to enforce as an agency, we'll figure it out. Um, but this is just not something I can get behind. 
Okay, thank you. Additional committee comments, Mr. Sanford. Uh, I'll, I guess I'll echo mostly what Ms. Clifford had said in terms of um, we will definitely find a way to to collect it or enforce it as it as it comes along, whichever the language, however the language ends up reading. I do tend to feel that uh, and agree uh, with Judge Rob's opinion in the first place, which is that this is something that seems and I think is inequitable. Um, when you're all in front of a single case, I would hope, as a you know, as a judicial officer, though, that when they're making this determination, that it seems easier to me to instead of modify the child support based off of taking away alimony money, it just makes more sense to order less alimony. Um, because that, as far as I know, there's no. I do not practice family law and in the part where alimony actually gets ordered. But as far as I know, that's an entirely discretionary number. Um, there's not. And so uh, to me, it seems easier to just say, oh, you know what? I ordered this much child support. This is how much their earnings are. This is how much alimony can actually be paid equitably um, based off of what I know I've already done and calculated. But I also, do understand that when those people are in front of you, it makes more sense to say, well, I'm counting. It, it seems dishonest to the person when they are standing in front of you to say, yes, I included this $500. I just ordered you to pay an alimony into your gross monthly income. But um, I do have concerns that there's a lot of things that are taken out of people's income. Um, and this one just seems I think more egregious because they're directly in front of you. Um, anyway, I, I haven't decided how I would vote or anything yet, but just that's that was my only thought. Okay, Senator Pickard. Thank you. I this is why I love this committee. Unlike so many other committees I sit on, we can kind of fully flesh this out without taking things personally. I never thought about, and I should have. But I'd never really considered the fact that uh, it, Ms. Cliff is spot on. It's discretionary. Alimony is discretionary. And the, the court, when it's establishing uh, uh, alimony, should be taking that into consideration. It should be right sizing the alimony award just as we try to right size the, uh, uh, the child support award. And we all know, I, I, I regularly counsel my clients that, you know, alimony doesn't have a calculation. It generally falls somewhere between, you know, 20 and 30% of the, dis the disposable income after child support uh, um, and all, but it's usually a consideration of total support. They look at how much is being paid in child support. They look at how much uh, uh, disposable income is left after that child support, and then they right size it. And so arguably, maybe it's already been considered, but we haven't really thought about it because we're stuck in the, the context of how do we calculate stuff when in fact, this isn't a calculation. Alimony is not a calculation, but it is post uh, uh, child support calculation. So I, again, I completely agree with Judge Rob's impulse, but boy, Miss Cliff makes a really good point, and I can't ignore that. That's why I love this committee. I would add on to that, and I'm not wedded to it either. And I'm starting coming around. I'm starting to hear all of this. Um, I think maybe where 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 it may feel. I hate the word gross, but you know, feel weird or strange to even think about or contemplate it on the district attorney side, on the private attorney side, the issue is greater than us um, and is probably what's coming to light of this, which is our alimony statutes are archaic. They haven't been rewritten. They haven't, no one would dare to touch them with the 10 foot pole at the legislature because it is a death sentence to touch alimony at the legislature. And so we have never fixed them. And so what we're feeling is that backlash of you've got a party 
whose income was whittled down to they can't pay their rent between their child support and their alimony payments and everything else that's hit them because no right sizing actually took place. Um, and that's probably why the gut instinct of a private lawyer, and especially when these statutes came out, they all had a heart attack about how do we deal with alimony and the child support? You didn't tell us how. And the not telling us how was the part was the complaint from the private bar. Uh, it was just silent. You threw in this one quick part on the gross income part of it, but you didn't, you totally ignored the other side of it. And so I, I've, I, I get this picture of the, yes, alimony is the right sizing. And maybe we're back to educating the bar on this part of it. Uh, but they feel we missed a whole, we completely missed and ignored the other side of it and didn't tell them what to do. Um, so is it that it should be deducted and make child support less? No, not necessarily based on this conversation, but they feel, they being the private bar, feels like we missed the ball, that we, we're missing a whole element there. Um, and maybe the conversation is kind of what came out of this conversation, which is child support's calculated first, then alimony. I don't even know if we have authority to do that with the way we, I, I'm not sure how that, no, I can't figure out how that would even work within our authority of what we've got jurisdiction over. Um, so, but you see where I'm going with that, where it's, okay, well, you're telling us that's the answer, but in private practice, is that what's happening? Probably not, <laughs> right? So additional committee comments. Do we let this simmer for now? Do we, okay, let's sit on it. And um, if and anything, yeah, go ahead, Judge. Oh, I was just going to say that's the intent. There's language here that we can at least noodle about now and, and try and figure out how we feel about it. Right. And perhaps Judge Rob and I can come back with maybe some other renditions based on this conversation or... Um, and just see if there's anything else to noodle on on the future agenda. Okay. This was good conversation though. I appreciate everybody. Absolutely. All right. Agenda item number 11, discussion and recommendations on NAC 425.1101D uh, to account for the possibility that TANF could have a name change. Uh, Senator Pickard, you... Um, you mentioned this um, based on the language we already voted on for the changes in the master document, um, which uh, it, if we want to, we just didn't have it on the agenda to be able to discuss it. I think it's a simple, personal opinion is it's a simple change to just say temporary assistance for needy families, cash assistance, or it's equivalent, or I don't know if that's proper language or not. Any thoughts from the committee? Um, oh, I, I was just going to ask Kathy, um, because I know the DWSS administrator needs to sign off on this. And Kathy, do you have a position on this? Can I just clarify real quick? We're, we're back to exhibit two, correct? Yes. Thank you. Under 425.110, the purple language that we already approved. We did approve this language. Senator Picker just uh, noted that the concern that what if in the future legislatively we change the name of TANF to something else. So this is Kathy Kaplan for the record. So he's not saying that it's currently going to change. He's just concerned that in the future. That we have going, a permanent, have, yeah, we have permanent language that lives through rendition gotcha. in the future. Okay, um, I would be okay as long as we say cash assistance paid through the state, some language like that, but I would run it by our administrator too, just to make sure we capture the intent of what TANF is. Okay, so maybe can we do this for right now? Can you do that running through them for the next uh, meeting and we'll... Um see what they're okay with and um yeah the, the concern just is 
obviously this committee is trying to do some things that are a little more permanent <laughs> and not needing us to constantly amend in the future if something happens, but Judge Hoskin. Yeah, my only comment is that the purpose of this committee was to be able to fix these things as they go through and you just address that in your last comment, but it, it's been TANF for a very, very long time. Certainly it's a concern that if it changes, but I think we have the ability from the legislature to be able to make that kind of change if we need to. I just think this is clearer and I think helps out uh, the, the DA side of it. Okay, Senator Pickard. Thanks, and, and the comment was just that, that, that uh, we do see Congress, particularly in today's Congress, where they're trying to make some changes and, and there's so much window dressing and so little substance uh, uh, that changing names uh, is, is becoming more and more frequent on, on various programs. And so my, my thought was simply that if we tie it to TANF by name and then Congress changes uh, that to a new name, now we've got an open hole. And so I, that's why I was suggesting something like, or its successor or, or uh, you know, something like that might help us so that we don't have to jump as a committee to make that quick change after Congress acts, because we're gonna have a gap. As we all know, this committee is as responsive as we are, we don't get anything done quickly because it's not always in our hands. It, it goes to DWSS, then it has to go to the Legislative Commission. They all have uh, time and, and these, uh, have these new regs have to be subject to public comment for a given period of time. And so as this takes time, we could conceivably have a gap. And I wanna close that gap uh, with some language if we think we need to, but to Judge Hoskins point, uh, it's been TANF for most of my adult life, so I don't know that they'll change that, but they did change it once within my lifetime, so who knows, uh, I, I'm just trying to be forward thinking. I, it, this is not a critical issue. I just thought maybe if we insert something like, or its successor uh, in federal law, uh, then uh, we might be safe, but it was just a, a thought that I had when we were going over it. Assemblywoman Cohen. Thank you. Um, pretty much a ditto or successor programs is, is pretty standard LCB language. So I would just add that. Okay. Um, let's see, Judge Hoskin, did you have another comment or did you just not lower your hand? Okay. Um, so I think what we'll do is let Kathy just follow up to see if there's any concerns on their end with adding or successor programs. And uh, then I'll keep it on the agenda for next time, but we at least have it there to discuss at this point. Okay. Agenda item number 12, discussion and recommendations on the means for um, division of medical costs, including whether the term equitable should be utilized for division. Uh, we, I don't know if we're ready for this today. I hadn't, this was an agenda item that from last time we wanted to make sure got on the agenda, but we haven't assigned anybody to work on language or really discuss it or really think about it uh, to propose anything. Unless somebody's ready and I don't realize it. Senator Pickard, you ready? I, no, I, oh. I didn't raise my hand to volunteer for that one too. Oh. I just okay. thought I would share uh, just yesterday, I had a case come up where we've got a, a child with special needs, physical needs, um, and his care is very expensive. Uh, I happen to represent uh, the, the parent who makes a fraction of what the other parent makes. And yet uh, most of these expenses are out of pocket expenses because they've long said, they uh, apparently meet their deductible in the first month of the year. And then, uh, yeah, that gives you an idea of how significant these expenses are. And the other side can, uh, and, and has historically um, uh, paid for these very easily. And now that the divorce is taking place, uh, my client is balking at having to pay for half of the medical expenses because that's going to bankrupt them. They don't have the capacity. Now, 
Um, the other side is backing away from their staunch position. So I don't think it's going to become an issue uh, that we're going to take to trial. I think we're going to be able to settle a case. But it raised for me, you know, I, knowing about this agenda and knowing this is coming up, I thought I would just mention that, that this is to some, and it's infrequent, but to some people, an equal division instead of a medical division, or I, I'm sorry, instead of an equitable division of medical costs, uh, all of a sudden to me makes a lot of sense. Or it makes sense to, to make that distinction. Are you? Are you saying in that scenario that you think equitable makes more sense versus equal? Yes, equitable makes more sense. In fact, uh, what I'm proposing is to rewrite the 30-30 rule in that case to do it on a, uh, a proportional basis based on gross income. Um, that They're balking at that. They're, they're not sure they want to do that, but I do see it going in that direction uh, because the income differential is so significant. Um, I, I don't think the judge on this case, who is not here, uh, is uh, going to miss the point uh, because the uh, monthly medical bills exceed the uh, disposable income of my client. Okay. Seeing no other hands at the moment, I would say my hope would be the use of the word equitable it, there's a lot of people kind of kicking in, trying to, you know, going off of what we used to do. Everything's always compared to what we used to have, right? Um, but I like the use of the word equitable for medical because of the example that you just gave is a good example. In the judge's discretion and ability, Judge Hoskin comment, ability for the court to do what they need to do to make it right. <laughs> uh, judge Rob, you had your hand, or I think raised, no? Did I see your hand raised? You didn't, but you. <laughs> or am you I throwing you under the bus? <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. You saw me unmute. Um, I don't know that equitable solves everything or makes things easier. It. If the default is 50-50, and if you can show good cause why it ought not to be, that makes more sense to me, quite frankly. Hmm. Because what I don't wanna do and what equitable gets us to is um, in different, in, in Clark County, in different judicial um, offices, in Washoe County, same thing, in the rurals, I would like similarly situated children to be treated similarly. And we know what that is, but we also know there are going to be exceptions to that rule. And we should have the ability to deal with those exceptions. Um, I could see a default to, well, we're just going to use the percentage of gross income, and that's how we're dividing medical insurance or medical costs every single time, um, which has some appeal, but is more difficult to deal with. 50-50 um, for me has some appeal because it, it acknowledges the fact that both parties have an equal obligation to that child. And each one of them needs to be able to respond to that obligation. Um, but we do, and you pointed out a great exception. Um, Madam Chair, I'm willing to take a whack at the language. Oh, that's always the good moment right there. <laughs> she just put herself out there. All right, any other committee comments? Kathleen Baker for the record. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to note that at this point in time, the NAC does not actually address unreimbursed medical expenses. When we first met and went over everything, we did not address what was NRS 125B0807, which stated that expenses for healthcare, which are not reimbursed, including the expenses of, for medical, surgical, dental, orthodontic, and optical expenses, must be borne equally by both parents in the absence of extraordinary circumstances. We sort of forgot about that when we initially did this. So we're actually going to be probably creating a new section in the NAC to address this. Okay. Madam Chair, if I might, 
Um, she's spot on correct. It, it is something that got dropped uh, inadvertently. Uh, it, we're not creating a new concept, uh, but uh, we're picking up where we left off, I think. Uh, and I, I see this as restoring something we had before, uh, where we had a statutory support for the, our, what we call the 3030 rule um, disappeared, although it still remained in practice. I, I think it's prudent to put it back. It's just how do we do that? And I, I love the, uh, the discussion. Madam Chair. Yes, sir. It, it, is it a child support issue? It is within the duties we have on the statutes that we have to, and on a federal level for DWSS that they have to address medical. And so unreimbursed I, medical expenses or, or health insurance costs. Right. Not, I think not I remembered there was a distinction when we started this and I could be wrong. Correct. Uh, DWSS is not allowed to address unreimbursed medical. Now, if the district court or, or collections district court order, wait, yeah, we, right. We can't, um, we can set a payment on it, but we cannot litigate it. I just, since 425 has been put in place, every final order that I sign has a 3030 rule and it hasn't changed. And in my mind, and, and maybe I'm looking at it wrong, it's not child support, it's parental obligation. And perhaps those terms end up coming into each other as a re result of what we do. But uh, I, I want to say, and it's been a very long time, that we had this discussion when I think we consciously left out that part of it because we went through that entire statute in redrafting it. So we may want to go back and take a look at those minutes uh, from the first iteration of this committee and see if we've already dealt with some of these issues. And perhaps there's some Maybe we were smart back then, maybe we weren't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it does bear out some, some research. Judge, yeah. I'll go back and take a look. Senator Pickard. Thank you. Uh, uh, Judge Hoskin makes a good point. My recollection was that the uh, uh, federal law referred to medical support. And uh, uh, so that's why I was thinking that it was part of child support because it's broader than just insurance. Um, uh, and uh, I remember in some uh, research running into other states, I was looking at something else, but running into other states' uh, paradigms where they view the, the uh, out-of-pocket as part of that medical support. And so it may be uh, just some cross-pollination with other statutes I've run across uh, but I was, I had in my mind that uh, it was medical support that was required. And so uh, it naturally fits, but that could be very easily just, you know, my misremembering all the stuff that I've touched. I, I would say that from the first renditions of this commission, that there was kind of some obsessive work on medical support because of that federal requirement from a bare bones level for DWSS. But if as a result of us focusing on that part of it, a part of the statute that was there that was given to us within our, our authority to modify dropped off a whole section of how, how family law was practicing in terms of the unreimbursed medical, whether it's within DWSS is, yeah, that was a mouthful, within their purview, to, uh, to litigate or not is something that was statutorily put in front of this commission because our job's not just what they have authority over. Um, and so if we dropped off a whole thing that people were utilizing on how to deal with unreimbursed medical, um, obviously parties can stipulate and they can put it in the order and those orders are getting in front of the judges that way. But um, the concern came from Miss Baker, which means there's a little bit of something going on there with that missing statute on their end of it also. But we can pull the minutes too. Okay. All right. Well, Judge Rob volunteered. She's on the spot. <laughs> and if we're good, I'll move on to the next agenda item. A discussion and recommendations on NAC 425.100 and language to clarify that the low income table does not meet the needs of a child or children. And this concern came forward from Ms. 
Cliff in prior meetings and requested to be placed on the agenda. Uh, again, this is another item that we don't necessarily have language in front of us yet. We just finally got it. We just got it onto the agenda so that we can open the discussion. Do we, Ms. Cliff, do you have anything you want to add to that? <laughs> Only that I can't remember putting this on the agenda. <laughs> um, it came up when we were discussing uh, meeting the needs of a child and you kept going, but the low income child does not do that. <laughs> it's right, right. enough money. Um, and whether or not any any language changes were needed in that regard. Mr. Sanford. I do remember this being caught up. I don't remember it specifically being on the agenda, but I do I would recommend I would and hope that maybe this this commission will at least take a look at um, clarifying in that piece where right now it, you know it says it's presumed that basically the child are met by the tools, child support obligation. We have a number of cases, I mean, I think incarceration cases are very common uh, where I am at. And you know, when we do a zero order, I mean, we obviously know that it doesn't meet the needs of these children. And so I think having something somewhere that establishes that, you know, either it meets the, the needs of the children or it's limited by the obligor's ability to pay however we want to put that language together um, because it should be one or the other. Either it should meet it or it should be because they just can't pay. Um, but I do know sometimes we get pushback when we do an order on the low income table um, and then somebody says, well, that just, that just doesn't meet the needs of the, of the child. And of course, that, that is something I think we all know. It's just it's built into our calculation already. We all know when we were looking at our, when we were first making the percentages, right? I mean, when you start at zero, yeah, sure, that might be what your income is, but, you know, the line of what the child needs doesn't start at zero. It starts at, you know, however many hundreds of dollars a month. And so uh, there are going to be those cases. I don't, I don't think right now that we're seeing any objections or appeals or issues like that. Um, I think it's more just a, an intellectual honesty type piece where we, you know, where folks understand where it's coming from. Senator Pickard. Madam Chair, I, I, it seems to me that this language comes directly from the uh, federal mandate, that uh, we're required to come up with a guideline that will meet the basic needs and, and that are presumed to meet the basic needs. And my fear is if we start tinkering with that language, uh, you know, we might be running afoul of the federal mandate. And so, I mean, I don't spend enough time in the federal law to, to really know, but that's just my reaction is if we're, if we ever think about uh, touching the language or equivocating, uh, does that then uh, uh, put us in conflict with the federal mandate? And if so, it's probably good for us to individually have that intellectual honesty and understand that, yeah, $10 a month or $30 a month, whatever, I've got the low standard or the standard right here. So the $82 a month, um, there's no way that meets the needs of any child anywhere, maybe in Costa Rica, but certainly not in the United States. So uh, I, I just, you know, we need to be careful as we tread on this. Uh, I have Judge Hoskin in my head. <laughs> Go ahead, Ms. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. okay. So, so some of this is starting to come back to me. Um, right. So I think in the past, uh, we just always knew, right, this, this met the basic needs of a child, and then you would just sort of look at deviations, as we called it back in the day. And, um, but I think the second we were all forced to consider these, the basic subsistence needs of the respondent or the non-custodial parent, the second we started having to consider that, it, it shifted. Um, so I don't know if it's something we need to state, but I would love to hear from the judges whether, are you still using that analysis before you consider an adjustment factor? You want me to weigh in, Madam Chair? All right, Judge Hoskin, for the record. Um, 
I, there's some comfort for me, if I'm being honest, in relying on uh, a regulation that indicates to me that it's already established what my presumption is and I know what to do to overcome that presumption. So there, there for me, there's a comfort level. Um, I, I have the same memory as, as Senator Pickard uh, that we had to put something that we're presuming that it meets the, the basic needs, but it's been too long for me to have a, a very specific recollection on that. But I don't remember the last time that I actually used that language uh, in court. Typically it's when someone is arguing you know, I, I, there's no way I can afford that. And then I blame it on, on this committee um, that <laughs> you need to take it up with them um, and, and get to that point because it's presumed that this, this is what you're supposed to be paying. So that's sort of my take on, I'm not sure that answers your question, but that's how I utilize that portion of it in the times that I do need to utilize it. I like and that verbiage, is... Judge Hoskin. This is presumed to be what you are supposed to pay versus meets the needs of a child. And this is Judge Rob, I don't do anything different. And I don't use that language um, regarding the presumption in my orders either. And the way that language ended up the, the, that it's presumed to be made, uh, presumed that the basic needs of the child are met came out of the federal language. It really was our attempt to make sure we were in compliance and um, telling us I, that that's what it has to be. You know? I, I am believing in the back of my head that that is exactly why that language is, exists is because it's required by um, the, the feds. I would, my personal take on this is that it's a um, solution without a, a serious problem in front of us, that it's not something that's causing cases to be derailed or appealed or, you know, any massive complaints. It was this committee trying to be work really hard at uh, Judge Hoskin intellectual honesty. And, <laughs> um, and, it's, I, and I think it's appreciated because I think this committee is taking its job very serious and we should take it serious. We should take every single word serious. Um, I just don't know that we need a change right now just for the sake of a change, unless something rises to the surface for us as a problem. Any other thoughts? Okay. I'm going to discontinue it from the future agendas, unless I'm asked to put it back on and then we'll consider it then. Um, okay, we're gonna move on to agenda item number 14, which is discuss and approve ideas for future agenda items and the next meeting date and time. Uh, any new agenda items anybody can think of? Okay. As far as dates, this last date got pushed out again because we just didn't have enough work product in front of us from everybody's job assignments. So I wanna make sure we don't run afoul of that again, but I also want to keep front and center for all of us that uh, we are going to start butting up against LCB's duties um, for the next legislative session. And so how far out does this committee believe we should set the next meeting? Thoughts, comments, anybody? What's what is our deadline? I don't have a solid one because when we get done, then DWSS has to do its public meetings on it and then it has to go to legislative commission. Um, obviously, they will stop working on any administrative committee work at some point. That's a vague point. Technically, they can work on it during session, too. It's just more of an understanding of the, the reality of what will actually happen. So if we're trying to get them to do something in a reasonable amount of time, we should have it to them by July? I would think August. so. July or August would probably okay. be safe, yeah. Um, without having to wait a whole another year for something to come out. Is two weeks too little again? Nothing happened the last time when I said it real quick. So I'm trying to be cautious. Um, Two weeks, three weeks. 
I cannot do three weeks, but I can do two weeks. Um, I'm available on the 3rd and the 24th of June uh, if we keep it on a Friday. Other comments? I'm worried that two weeks is too close, that I'm going to end up doing the exact same thing and pushing it out again because I didn't get any work product from anybody. So I'm going to be... Um, Senator Pickard, you're not available again until the 24th. Um, but I think that's too far out. Yeah. I was going to say, I, I will also be unavailable except for on the third or the uh, 24th and the third. I, as far as I know, other than my involvement with the serial parenting group, um, is there any desire or I didn't hear anything from anyone for changes on the the XXX language or, or pieces. And so um, I don't actually think we have as much work to be done in terms of drafting new language. I think a lot of the work to be done seems to be meshing it all together into a somewhat final form. Um, so maybe we should consider assigning someone to be doing, I think, some of that work, probably not me. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, I would say June 3rd. I don't want to push it all the way out till June 24th. I really don't. Um, and is, unfortunately, I'm, I'm unavailable on the 24th, so the 3rd is, is better. Okay. So if we do June 3rd, is, is everybody clear on what their assignments are right now to prepare for that meeting? Okay. My understanding is that I just need to yell at Senator Pickard about something, but I don't recall exactly what it was. <laughs> That's always your assignment. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you, you do it regularly. What's different today? <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So Madam let's, Chair, yes. before you guys move on, I want to make sure that um, you know that you skipped a couple of agenda items, I believe number four, which is fine. I just want to make sure that you're not meeting, uh, missing any of your committee deadlines or time requirements by doing that. If that can be put off, then it's fine. No, agenda item number four, I skipped because we already dealt with it. It got left, it was a holdover on the agenda and that's already been dealt with at the last meeting. Okay, that's fine, thanks. Agenda so. number five, I skipped because technically it was also still the same document that we were discussing under number six. So I wasn't worried about it, so, okay. So June 3rd will be the next meeting. If additional agenda items, um, percolate to the surface, let me know and we'll get it onto the agenda. And for those of, um, those of you that are part of the public that are listening, we also want to entertain your ideas. So feel free to also reach out. If you look at the agenda for today's meeting, there is additional information, contact information in there and, and ways to submit things to our committee. Uh, moving on now to agenda item number 15, which is public comment. Uh, we'll take public comment at this time. Again, it is limited to three minutes per person. And if you could go ahead and do that, please, Ms. Tomlinson. To give public comment, please raise your hand in the Zoom meeting or press star nine on your phone to take your place in the queue. I'm showing no hands are raised at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, I am going to move on to adjourn this meeting. Again, get everything in you need for the next meeting ahead of time. And that way we can um, properly label the exhibits and get the agenda out properly. Uh, if we can, Ms. Tomlinson, can we send the recording from this hearing to each of the committee members? That way they can utilize that versus uh, the meeting minutes if they need it to check in on what they promised to do during this meeting. Um, I'll look into it. Usually the file is too big and it's hard to compress it to email it, but I can um, request that it get posted on the YouTube page so we can then get the link onto our website as soon as possible. That way it's accessible for everyone. That would be great because that would come out sooner than the minutes and that would be helpful, I believe, for the committee members. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We're going to adjourn. I appreciate everybody's time today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone.